Okay. All right. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. So um, this will be the Locke's lecture, I believe. Um, so in the in the second lecture, basically, we're, we're introduced to the problem uh, whether weak F regularity localize this, or so put it differently. So to two, one of the focuses was whether weak F regularity implies F regularity. Right. So <clears throat> so now we're gonna sort of in, you look at the stronger conclusion. So let me put this open problem uh, here. Oops. Okay. Am I right? Well, you don't let me write. Yeah. Hmm. Sorry. Um, let me start over. Apologize for that. So let me, ah, whew, okay. So let me mention this open problem. Um, okay, so in the literature, this was, has been referred to the weak implies strong problem. So I believe we have seen the notion of strong F regularity, right? So, or let me probably recall that. So. Oh. Oh. So recall. Now, I believe when Ling Chen defined this, uh, there is a qualifier. So the ring assumed to be a finite out continue to do so, okay. So M and F finite ring. Uh, well, let's say it's reduced, okay. R is strongly of regular if for all C not in any minimal primes, there exists a E such that this map, so R goes to, because R is reduced, I can take uh, P's root and then repeat this, so I take P to the E's root. So one goes to C to the one over P to the E, this split. Okay, I believe that's how we define, um, okay. All right. So, so I'd like to mention some approach uh, to this problem. <clears throat> to this end, I want to maybe characterize both properties with, using modules. Okay. So the first theorem, I want this, of course, was due to Hawks and Unique. Says the following. So R is weakly F regular, even only if for every pair, so N is containing M with M finitely generated. So N is actually tightly closed in M. So N is the same as the tight closure of N in L, okay? Now the keyword here is finally generated. So, cause in a moment we will see a very similar characterization of strong F regularity, but we're gonna drop this qualifier, uh, finally generated. So, so the so parallel statement for strong F regularity will be R is strongly average, if and only if for every pair of modules. Finite general or not, uh, every sum module will be tightly closed. Okay. All right, so let's prove this. 
Now, only one direction requires a proof because if I assume the statement for modules, I can simply replace M by R and M by I. Okay. So assume, so R is weakly half regular. So we're gonna prove by contradiction. So let's assume there exists such a pair. So N is in M, both finite generated. That's crucial here. And so N is not tightly closed. So that means I can pick. So there exists a Z, which is in the tight closure, but not in M, okay? So we want to reduce to the, to the ideal case, and um, here's how. So consider all some modules of M that doesn't contain Z. The set is not empty because N is in there, right? Our assumption. Uh, so you can, by say, Zwan's Lama, you can see there is a maximum element. So there is a maximum such module. Uh, we're going to call it L. Okay. So certainly N is containing L. So Z is not in L. N is containing L because Z is containing L. I know that the tight closure of N, it will be containing the tight closure of L. So that means Z is still in the tight closure of L, but Z is not in L. So I can replace M by L now because the condition is preserved, okay? All right, so we may replace M by L, okay? So we're looking at those triples. So I have a Z, I have a L, I have a M, right? I can, so by, by modding out L, uh, we now consider Z, because Z is not in L, so Z is still non-zero, and, and M, okay? So I'm replacing L by zero and M by M modulo L. So now we're looking at the condition. So Z is not zero and Z is containing the tight closure of zero in L, okay? So what's the benefit of doing this? The benefit is, well, because L is the maximum such module, which does not contain Z. So once I kill L, I know Z is containing every single non-zero sum module by the construction of L. Or put it differently, if I consider cyclic module generated by Z, so R dot Z, oh, I probably should be this way. So M is an essential extension of the cyclic module generated by Z, so R dot Z, okay? So now let's consider uh, any associate prime of M. So uh, say, so P is an associated prime of M. So my claim is P must be a maximum idea. Okay. Now, <laughs> so because P is an associated prime, so I know there is a natural embedding from R mod P to M. So I may consider R mod P as a sum module of M and Z must be contained in R mod P. Not only that, Z is contained in every single non-zero sum module of P. So if P is not a maximum module, so the dimension of R mod P is at least one, uh, 
then our map this cannot contain one element that is in every single ideal. Okay. So now if dimension R mod P is at least one, then it does not contain an element um, that is in every non-zero ideal, okay? Because every ideal of R mod P now can be considered as some module of L. So that implies P is a maximum ideal. So now from now on, I'm gonna write P as M, okay? By the same reasoning you can show there's only one associate prime, a maximum ideal. All right, so now I, you can, because M has only one associate, so uh, similar reasoning, by the same reasoning, or you can say, uh, if we want to localize M as totally fine as well, so, uh, you know, well, let me just do that. So now uh, consider our localized M. Because M is a maximum ideal, so our local at M is still weakly at regular. So still weakly at regular, okay. All right, so M we still find a generated and has only one associated prime, which is the maximum ideal. This means oh, M has finite lines. So this implies M has finite lines. So that means a power of the maximum ideal will kill M, okay? All right, so the next step is uh, probably the only step I won't prove for you, um, but I do need the property of weekly F regular ring. So R M, this is weekly F regular. We know that this implies it's normal, okay? I believe we have seen this before. Okay. It must be a coin I call it normal ring, okay? It's normal. And now there's a theorem by Mel Hoxter back in 1977. This tells us, so every power of M contain an irreducible primary idea, okay? And this is where he introduced this notion called approximately Gorenstein ring. All right, so normal rings are, normal domains are approximately Gorenstein. So every power of the maximum idea must contain an irreducible and primary idea. Okay, so that means there exists an irreducible and primary ideal Q that is contained in M to the N. Okay, so now, so M is an R mod Q module. Okay. Now, because Q is irreducible and R mod Q is a tenia. So we know R mod Q is that you Gorenstein and is self-injective. Um, so this implies one and two. Um, so R mod Q is self-injective. So this is Gorenstein. But this is where the name of proximate Gorenstein comes from. Okay. Uh, so let me do a quick proof. So one way to characterize Gorenstein running is that it has a parameter ideal. Well, parameter means a general by a full system parameter that is irreducible. Now, because Q is irreducible, so the zero ideal in R mod Q must be irreducible as well. 
but zero ideal is a primary ideal view because we're looking at the Artinian ring. So the ring must be Gorenstein. And Artinian Gorenstein ring are self-injected. So meaning R mod Q is actually injective module. Okay. Okay. So now the assumption is Z is containing every single non-zero sum module, and my M has finite lines. Right. So a Z must be contained in this non-zero sum module. Okay. This is called a circle. Now, the circle must be one dimensional by assumption because if the circles are sort of k-vector spaces and the one dimensional k-vector space, if they are different, the intersection must be zero. So Z can only be contained in one copy of the k-vector space. But Z is containing every non-zero sum module that will force uh, the circle to be one dimensional can only be one copy of a k. Okay, so now let's combine the two, these two things together. R modulo, so Z generates a circle. So the, the cyclic sum module generated by RZ, so sorry, I mean one, one more step. So this tells us okay, so the cyclic module generated by Z is actually one copy of the residue. So M is an essential extension of the residue field. Now R module Q is actually injective that contains K. Uh, that tells us M must be contained in R mod Q. Because the injective, for example, the injective power of the residue field is the maximum essential extension of K. And so given any other essential extension, you better have injection from that essential extension into the injective part. Okay. So that tells us, um, so M can be embedded into R modulo Q. Okay. Okay, so now the zero sum module in M now corresponding to zero in, in R modulo Q, therefore corresponding to Q in R. But R is weakly at regular, so Q is tightly closed. That tells us zero must be tightly closed in M. Now, since Q is tightly closed, so zero must be tightly closed in M. But that's a contradiction, our assumption, because we the, the presence of element Z. So Z is in the particular zero in M, but Z is not zero. So that would be a contradiction. Okay. okay, so any question on this page? I do have a question. Sure. Uh, can you explain again why M has finite length? M is finally generated, right? So, mm -hmm. so if you have a finally generated module, there's always a prime filtration. Oh, I see. Right, but the, the prime module can only be maximum ID because the maximum value is the only associated prime. I see, okay. So that means that prime filtration actually gives you uh, the, the composition series and it's finite, right? Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, the, any other questions? I have one, Wang Liang. Uh, yes. At the end of the day, M is just the injective hull of the residual field of yes. uh, our modem. Yes. Because of course, uh, if this is an essential extension of blah, blah, and then you, you do all the whole argument and at the end you are saying, okay, M injects inside this. And, but what I am understanding, if I am not wrong, M is the injective hull, right? M? Is the injective uh, hull of R mod M. Uh, so uh, R mod capital M, capital M, I mean. Oh, capital M is just an essential extension. So it may, may, may not okay. be. You, so you, you don't know whether M, uh, capital M is the, is the injective hull. A priori, oh, you don't know. 
We don't okay. know that. Uh, let's okay. just so here. So M is actually a sum module, mm -hmm. a finite general sum module of the mm -hmm. Indian file. So R module Q, that's the Indian file. Ah, okay, okay, okay. 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 Because that, so R module Q is self-injective. So R module mm -hmm. Q is actually injective. Mm -hmm. It's local, so can, it doesn't split. Ah, right? okay. So that forces to be the Indian file. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, so if not, I'm gonna to try to uh, add a new page. Okay, yay, it worked. Okay, all right. Um, so now I'm I'm gonna characterize uh, the strong F regularity, but there's a point uh, to make and just an approach to prove uh, whether or to prove that weak implies strong. Okay. So here will be the close theorem three. Again, this will do to Hoxter and Hume. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's say R is. All right. So I mentioned the principle. I'm going to apply the principle here. It's a complete local domain. And these are finite. So since I mentioned a finite, so must be in character P. Okay. Then the followings are equivalent. Okay, so part A is so R is strongly. Uh, let me be try to be efficient for a moment. It's strongly F regular. Okay. And part B is um, so N is tightly closed in M. Right, so this is for every module, okay? Instead of finite genome, every module M and every sub module. And in M, okay? And C is, well, we don't have to look at every R module. There's one module that, that captures this property, which is the injective power of the residue field. So this is just E is, ah, sorry, let me just say this is R and K of K, okay? So, okay. Um, I won't prove, do I need to prove three implications here. So A implies B, B implies C, then C implies A. B implies C is trivial, so, I'm gonna skip the implication A implies B. Now the proof is quite similar to our proof on pre the page and plus something about uh, this uh, forbidden map, okay? So the idea is quite sim similar to the pre the page um, plus the idea in the implication C implies A. So I'm gonna just prove C implies A. Right, so proof of a C implies A. Okay. Uh, so say, so U is a generator of the circle of E, because this is in general how we know that is this, the cycle is the one dimensional, okay? Now, since, now E is an, is, so that means, so the cyclic sum module generated by U is just one copy of K, okay? that's what it means. Now, The Indian how of K certainly is an essential extension of K. It's a maximum essential extension, right? Of K, um, so that tells us this condition holds if and only if U is not in the tight closure of zero because U 
is contained in every non-zero sum module of E. Okay, so if the tau decolor of zero is not zero, it must contain U. Okay, so, so that means it suffice so far to check U is not in the tau decolor of zero in E. All right, so to do that, we're gonna go back to the definition of tight closure uh, for modules. Um, now, to somehow ease the notation, I'm gonna use R to the one over P to the E notation. Okay. So um, one may view the Frobenius, or rather the East Frobenius, as this inclusion, okay, right. So once you do that, because in the definition of tau decolor for modules, we need to apply the passing spiral function to the module. So this is F E. Now this becomes the so R to the one over P to the E. Now tensor over R is E. Okay, and so the action scope so here, so R, I need to tell you the module structure. So this R acts where this is for Benius, okay. All right, so, um, okay. So just by the definition of tau decolor over zero or tau decolor for modules in general, uh, but this is just side note. I'm just changing the notation from the passing spiral functor F E uh, to this um, fraction power of R. Okay. So, so U is not, so U, sorry, U. So U is not in the tau flow of zero in E amongst to For all C in R circ, well, meaning C non zero. For every non zero element C, there is an E such that. So basically, I'm just doing the negation of the definition of that color. Uh, C to the one over P to the E tensor with U. This is not zero in this tensor product, okay? Now, which is equivalent to the following. So we're gonna tensor Um, this R linear map where one goes to, so one go to C over one to the P to the E. So tensoring this with E, the image of U is not zero. Okay, I'm just translating this condition on the bottom on the left, okay. Now, because E is an essential extension, so since E is an essential extension of E cycle, which is generated by U, uh, this condition here, so the non, the image being non-zero, so the image of U being non-zero now is equivalent to the injectivity of this map, so tensor over E goes to 
R over E. Okay. So it's identity on E, but on the other hand, the map from R to R to the one over P to the E is sending one to C to the one over P to the E. Okay. Now I want to check this is actually uh, injective. So, so why is it equivalent? Because if there's assume there's a kernel, and this is isomorphic to E, by the way. So if there's a non-zero kernel, then U must be in the kernel because U is containing every single non-zero sum module, right? So the image of U being non-zero means this map must be injective. Okay. So now, so hum this into E. So we turn injectivity into surjectivity now. So it's equivalent to the sur Objectivity of, uh, you know, let me not skip any step. Into E goes to harm. Now E and E. Okay. All right. This is isomorphic. Now, here I'm using the fact my ring is complete. So harm E into E just R. So in for this harm module on the left, I'm using uh, a junction between harm and tensor. So this will be isomorphic to harm R. P to the E into R. And now this is isomorphic just to R, okay? So that means this is surjective. Well, surjective means that uh, I can hit one. So that means, so i.e. there exist phi in, or let me write this way, back to R such that uh, okay, so let me give this map a name. Maybe I call it state uh, C comma E, okay? Such that um, if I can pull this to C E, this is identity on R. Okay. So that's exactly the condition we're looking for. So that means uh, this math from R to R to one over P to E, where send which send one to C to one over P to E, this map I split because I found the inverse, the left inverse for it. So that shows R is strongly of regular. Okay, so that will be uh, the proof I'll see in point A. Okay. Any question on this? Okay, so if not, uh, I'm gonna move to a new page. Okay, now if we combine these two characterization together, uh, this tells us one approach to proving that weak implies strong. Okay, so, so these two characterizations um, tell, tell us we may consider the following. We may consider the union of the tight color of zero, M where, so M is a finitely generated sum module of E, okay? Because individually, if we consider the tight color of zero in M, M is finally generated. So individually, this should be captured by the weak F regularity. Okay. Then we take the union, the hope is that the union will capture strong F regularity. So let me state that. Certainly this is open problem and this is actually equivalent to the weak implies strong 
condition. So I believe this is four now. Uh, I'm going to write this away. So, so tied chlorine zero in E, whether this is in the, the same as a big union, because the, this union certainly is contained in the tidal color zero. Okay. So I should put a question mark here. Okay. Now this problem is equivalent to the weak implied strong problem. And um, so here's one way to see it. So it's quick proof. Um, so if R is weakly F regular, then by the cartization, every individual one now will be zero because M is finally generated. So M is finitely generated, okay? But that means the union is zero. If the union is zero, then based on the open problem that says zero is totally closed. And so by the cartization of strong F regularity that shows the ring must be strongly F regular. So this will provide at least one approach uh, to attack the problem, uh, whether weak implies strong, okay? Now, but can we actually achieve anything using this approach? Uh, the answer is yes. So this brings us to the theorem by uh, Gennady Lubeznik and Karen Smith. So, but this has a name, this is called I should say, this is called the, the finite testic particular of zero. So finite testic on particular. So meaning you take the particular inside the finite general sum module and take the union over that. Okay. So let me mention the, the result. Okay. So the content is an ungraded. So the reason for sort of for us to look at the graded ring is the following. In the previous lecture, we've seen that. Even for the LC problem, uh, you can actually solve it for the in, in the gradient setting. So that's at least one indication the gradient setting should be somewhat easier. Okay. So F finite ring is weakly F regular, even only if it is strongly uh, regular. Okay. Now, I won't be able to prove this in like 10 minutes. Uh, initially in my notes that I sent to Stachner, I, I had a complete proof, but I, I don't think it can fit in 10 minutes. Um, so let me just mention sort of the crucial idea here. So what the actual proof is the following. So at the technical heart, here is their theorem. So the technical core is the following. Again, this is due to the Basnik and Karen Smith. Well, the proof is that the following. Under the same assumption, so R is still ungraded, a finite. And say any Artinian graded ring, oh, sorry, Artinian graded R module. Okay. Then the following holds. If you take the tidy chloride of zero in M, this turns out to be the following union. Okay, so delta. Or delta is ranging all delta. So means we truncate M 
because m is a tenion, so we know that there is a upper bound on the degree. So after a certain degree or beyond certain degree, m is entirely zero. So if we truncate at a degree, now we have only finite many degree pieces, and that is actually finite generated. So this is finite generated. So that's their idea. So instead of considering all the arbitrary finite generated sum module, they consider some special one, okay, the truncation by degree. And they succeeded in proving that uh, the tight chloride is at the union of tight chloride in such truncations. And that's that solved the problem in the graded case. Okay. All right, so a uh, cassette upshot is once we have the characterization, you do have this uh, approach. But how do we actually generalize their approach in the gritty setting back to say the local setting, which is really the heart of the problem for weak implied strong, okay? So here, let me mention uh, sort of an open problem. So the analog of this truncation So here we take the truncation, right? So what's the analog in the local case? The analog of this in local case is the following. I can take the pieces that's acute by a power on maximum ideal, okay? So we may call this MN, for example, okay? That will be a local analog. And so sort of the open problem or just uh, if it's equivalent to it before, so I'm gonna write this as for prime maybe. Um, so whether the touch closure of zero in E is the same as the following union, I take the touch closure of E sub N. Okay, so it's for all N. Again, E sub n means uh, the sum module that is killed by n's power of m, and that's finally generated because m, R modulo m to the n is has finite length. And so you harm into E, that's you have finite length. All right, but this is a wide open. So this is wide open, certainly. Okay, so that means this weak implies strong problem is wide open in the local case. So uh, now I probably move on to say some partial result. Uh, but before that, uh, any questions on this page? Uh, if not, let me move on to the partial result. Okay. So now that's the partial result. I won't be able to prove any of this in the next five minutes. So, um, so let me call this theorem. Okay, this five, I believe. Oh, sorry, the five was the theorem by, this was six. So I'm just gonna mention a whole bunch of partial results now. So, so weak, uh, implies strong, if, so one, if the dimension of R is three, this will due to Williams. So the project here is also somehow to, to extract a uniform bound on the kernel. Oh, sorry, let me start one, take one step back. So local cohomology, so the indicative of E can be viewed as a local cohomology of the canonical module. Now local cohomology is the Dirac's limit of kazoo homology. So we need to understand the transition maps 
in the drug system consisting of the kazoo homologies. So the whole idea is that to analyze the kernel of those transition maps and to extract some uniform behavior, okay? And then he's to succeed in dimension three. Okay. Now, Now in dimension four, but it's not quite a local case, I need to put in some qualifiers. So R, so this is due to Arbabach and Postro, very, very recently, okay? So it's published early this year. So assume that this is a finite generated K algebra. In dimension four and K has infinite transcendent degree. Over the finite field LP, okay? So under the assumptions in dimension four, a uh, weak implies strong. Now, their approach is a finer analy analysis of this uh, transition map of the kuzu between the kuzu complexes. Um, it's too technical for me to state that, okay? But now maybe uh, last like, why did I say four? This two, huh, because dimension four, okay. Now, Now, if R is coin Macaulay with an isolated, oh, I just, sorry, let me take that back. Let's say if R is Gorenstein, okay? And this will be an exercise for you, okay? Now, for uh, this is due to Again, due to uh, Liu Basnik and Smith in a different paper. Okay, so if so, R is Macaulay with an isolated non Gorenstein point. So meaning, so R local at the P is Gorenstein. If P is not a maximum ideal, okay? And lastly, let me just mention this result by Annie Rock Sink. So if R is Q Gorenstein, but of course he proved something even Stronger, he showed that if you are in the Q Gorenstein, then uh, um, splinters are strongly uh, fragile. Okay, I think I, I need to stop here. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Wen Liang. Wonderful talks. Are there any thank questions? You. Just a little curiosity, who proved the result for R. Gorenstein? R. Gorenstein? Uh, the one that you oh. left as an exercise. Oh, sorry, I, I should, <laughs> yes, let me write. This, this was already proved originally by Paul Hawks and Hune, okay. Are there other questions? No? If not, well, thank you very much, Wen Liang, for wonderful talks. All right, thank and you for the invitation.
and we will see everybody on Monday. All right, see you on Monday.